are available in financial services industry. Now, what their suggestion is that to make it more interactive, they, you, the floor is open for question and answers after each question. So if you have completed something on mobile analytics and AI applications in financial industry, please feel free to ask those relevant questions after that session. So we'll open the floor for that section itself. Then the next one and then the next one. So three times we'll get to ask uh, questions. Please be ready. It's a very, uh, it's a privilege to have these, at least uh, I know of two gentlemen who have uh, uh, gone from right from scratch uh, to becoming the CIOs and CTOs of big financial firms. Fantastic experience in financial services industry as well as uh, uh, in technology expertise. Okay, so please ask them questions. There is nothing like stupid or basic question. Please feel free. Aapke man mein kuch bhi doubt ho, please ask. Okay, this is the right forum, please ask them. That's why we have arranged these sessions also for you. Okay, so please feel free to do all those things. Distinguished uh, guest of today and the panelists for today, uh, members of the faculty, uh, my dear students, a very good morning to you all and uh, welcome to this session, panel discussion on uh, technology-led disruption in the financial industry. Advances in technologies such as mobile, robotics, analytics, and artificial intelligence are reshaping financial services industry with disruptive business models. The industry has been, since a long time, an early adopter of uh, technologies since the electronic revolution. Right from uh, ATMs, to credit cards, to online net banking, to mobile apps, to e-wallets, and to virtual assistants. The financial services has revolutionized how financial services are transacted, how customers are advised, how risks are managed, how investment portfolios are designed, and how services are delivered. So today, to discuss on this topic, we have uh, distinguished panelists from the industry. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Siddharth Bhatt, Head of Information Technology, Aditya Billa Sun Life AMC. Uh, Siddharth has uh, an experience of over 19 years in the IT and financial sectors and uh, he has held various roles from being a developer to now a CTO of one of the largest mutual fund uh, companies. Siddharth believes in a business first approach and is very passionate about technology's role in changing the face of financial services in India. He has been instrumental in having banks and AMCs overhaul their technology landscape to ensure that they are at a cutting edge in increasingly competitive markets. 
So once again, please welcome Mr. Siddharth Bhatt. We also have a very distinguished personality, Mr. Biren Parekh, who is the Vice President of Intellect Design Arena. Biren has over 21 years of rich global experience in portfolio and program delivery management. He has proven domain expertise in corporate and retail banking with, exper uh, with experience of executing projects globally. He is a PMP and Prince II ITIL and certified Scrum Master. He is also a PMI India champion and advocating project management in India. He also provides consultancy for program and project management for core banking applications, restructuring, migration, and decommissioning of BFSI projects. On a personal front, as you can all see, he is a fitness freak and also a marathon runner. And uh, he writes very interesting blogs. And please do visit uh, birenparik.com and you'll get a lot of insights into what's happening in this world. Okay, so please once again, uh, give them a big, big round of applause. Right, so as we start off with this session, the format would be in terms of uh, a question and answer that we would be discussing within the panelist and post this question, you will be, the floor will be open for the audience to ask the questions. So please, we have faculties, uh, we have uh, the guests here who are very, very experienced. So please feel free to ask them those questions as students and they'll be glad to answer, right? So with uh, digital currencies, blockchain, artificial intelligence and robotics being the new kids uh, on the block, it's time we equip ourselves to know how technologies and technology is and will be disrupting uh, the financial services industry. So we have more than 950 million mobile connections in India now around 475 million internet users. This is all India data. 200 million mobile internet users and 150 million social media users in India who are producing data in the last 48 hours that had been produced in the last decade. Okay, so in the last 10 years, whatever data had been produced is equal to what we have produced in the last 48 hours. So, Based on your viewpoints, how are mobile, robotics, analytics, AI, all these new digital technologies reshaping uh, the financial services industry? Uh, Mr. Start, you can begin. Uh, so I'll, I'll give a very uh, business perspective to it rather than more from a, from a technology perspective. So, See, all of, these, all of these technologies eventually have to lead to some uh, business benefit uh, at the end of it. Um, the, the way the, the market has been really changing, if you've seen in the last five years, has been extremely dramatic. Also, the, the, the landscape of technology is you know, very, very different from what it was five years ago. Today, if we have the capability from a technology perspective to get customers uh, onboarded, transacting, and know the life history of a, of a customer even without seeing the customer. And that is a huge shift. It is, uh, I would say, from an India perspective, extremely important because though the numbers which are from a mobility, social perspective, very, very high, from a financial inclusion perspective, we're just starting. Uh, especially from a mutual fund industry, if you, if you actually see, uh, there's a lot of, lot of uh, advertising happening on, on mutual funds now. We're seeing a huge amount of growth. But despite that, the startling statistic is that only 5% of the country is actually investing in mutual funds right now. So the potential of reaching to 95% of the population is immense. And how are you going to do that? The only way to do it is through the technologies which uh, have been mentioned. Now, today, 
there are we have launched our mobile apps through which you know customers can come on board and start transacting within a couple of minutes and that's not not just a claim you know you can really come if you're not a mutual fund customer you can start using a, just download an app and start transacting in 2 minutes whereas earlier what used to happen is you needed to get a form fill the form uh, send it to some branch then you don't know what what has happened to the application maybe after a, after a week or 10 days if you're lucky then you'll actually see what's what's really happening in the meantime your money is gone from your bank account and you you're really wondering where where the money is really gone that's all a past and this has only been enabled uh, by technology and that's a huge shift the other thing which uh, has really changed and is changing is the amount of data now yes we are generating so much of data in the last 48 hours as we claim what we had not done in a decade but the main question is what are we doing with that data and as students the main focus for you guys should be to understand this information and see how we're going to leverage it because the workforce in india as of now don't really know how to leverage that information so data is there but they are very limited by their work experience that they have had you imagine people who have been working in the financial industry for the last 20 years uh, they have a very fixated view of what can technology do and since you are the new millennials y'all have that advantage that when you all get into the Uh, into your respective organizations working get that different perspective in on what the what data can really do so it really is a matter of your left to your imagination with what is to be done with so much of data which is really coming in right can data from social media be really applicable for guys with finance background now the question is for you guys to answer right you have to find the correlations and then use it to your benefit this is where i think the road map is the country at least in india is is really weak as of now the e-commerce has really gone ahead you have the amazons the flipkarts really using that data but from a financial industry perspective that realization is just coming in now and i think that's for you guys a huge space where you can utilize that Uh, uh going forward so that's my two bits we yeah. we can come back with other questions so here uh, uh sudat uh, you just spoke of uh, there's a huge potential we've just had 5% of people who are actually doing uh, online mutual funds a large amount of data that can be tapped not online they're just so online is even a sm- even a smaller small, percentage so just 5% investing in mutual so 5% funds so 5% of the 5% are actually online so just imagine the uh, the potential that you have so huge potential here for uh, mutual funds so that's where i come to birain uh, birain you have a lot of uh, experience in actually doing transformation projects etc yeah. so what are some of the initiatives that organizations are taking to tap this kind of potential so please could you share some insights uh, on that sure definitely um, thanks rahul <clears throat> so i think uh, first of all i like to just highlight uh, some of the new trends which are there in the industry and uh, which is transforming the uh, i'll say the banking segment so as we all know now the biggest threat to um, banking is from technology companies and not actually from the banks right so all of us know that and uh, that is actually driving the full innovation i'll say complete innovation uh, maybe rahul if you can just uh, maybe play that uh, one slide so that now we can uh, run through it <clears throat> okay so i feel that there are several kind of uh, um, sort of uh, innovations which are happening and um, that is driving uh, the i'll say the not just uh, banking but full society okay the way we live the way we pay way we spend all of that is changing because of the kind of technological innovation so maybe i'll just I'll yeah just yeah so um, <clears throat> first of all i'll say that uh, in banking industry particularly uh, i'm not sure how many of you have heard about uh, api banking has anyone heard about api banking please raise your hands 
Okay, so basically um, API banking is a banking whereby uh, you are exposing your services. Okay, bank is exposing their services to the third party. Okay, so as of now, as we all know that when we do the banking, internet banking, we are doing banking through their bank's portal, right? You either go to HDFC bank portal or you go to ICICI bank portal. But now the trend is that you will start doing the banking through third party. So when I say third party, what happens is that banks will expose there a sort of a particular API or particular service to a third party who can use your, who can use a bank's uh, data and give it to a customer in different form. Okay, so that is one of the new trend which is happening and uh, there is a, in particular in Europe, there is a uh, PSD2, there's a new directive which is coming, which is actually more of a regulatory framework, whereby they are asking all the banks to expose their services to bank and to third party. So how it will help? So I'll just say that uh, one example. Now, um, all of us might be having more than one account, that is for sure, right? And what do you do right now? If you want to check balance, then you will go to one bank's portal, you will check your balance, then you go to another bank's portal, you check balance, right? As of now, you don't get a universal view. So with this kind of services, which will offer the, uh, which will give the API to a third party, there will be a, a sort of a companies, technology companies, which will actually give you a unified view, okay, whereby it will show you the balances from all your different bank accounts when you set up the, uh, set up your portal or set up your user ID. And you, know, you can do transaction from a third party app or third party portal, okay? And you don't need to go to HDFC, ICIC, or maybe whatever X number of banks uh, portal to figure it out. Now how, um, uh, where, where to find the balance or how to do the transfer. So it will be purely third party um, uh, portal or apps which are coming up. And um, there is already a sort of attraction happening in India, but still it is not full-fledged. But in Europe particularly, this PSD2 directive, uh, which has been regulation given by uh, the European um, uh, banks, is uh, going to drive this. Okay, so that is one thing which uh, which is going to change the banking industry. And uh, see, that is a sort of a use case. But what is the impact to the banks? Okay, impact to the banks is that less people will start coming to the banks. Okay, the sort of commission which banks are charging, okay, or any intermediaries which are charging will come down because it will go to third party. Okay, so that is another sort of a, a impact or a, I will say benefit to maybe third party portal or this benefit to a banks which is going to uh, cause a disruption. Okay, so that is one of the point. So here, uh, uh, when we talk of uh, API and the different technologies that are coming into place, uh, what do you think with such a acceleration of technology, what would be the kind of uh, impact that would it would have on the society uh, as a whole? You know, like uh, how how does the society react to financial services? Okay, so um, I'll say that um, society is um, as a consumer, okay, as a customer or consumer, we are very much delighted, but by, by the kind of technology being offered by the bank. Okay, maybe all generation, maybe our fathers might be like, no, they are still reluctant to adopt it, uh, adopt to new technology. But we as a millennial are very much uh, no, happy that it saves our time standing in the queues or you can do the banking from any time. And nowadays you don't have to worry about that. Now you can only do the transaction during the working hours or even on the weekend also through IMPS, you can still do the transaction, you can transfer the money to anyone. Right, so those kind of advantages are coming to the people. People are having more time to na, their personal, whatever personal interest or personal benefit, whatever for family. Right. That is one thing which is happening. Right. What do you think about that, uh, Siddharth? I, I think uh, what's going to happen is we're going to see waves. Right, uh, uh, the way the technology is changing and uh, the way we are adopting technology is. Uh, so definitely technology has made things much easier for us. Now the question really is, after a certain point in time, today we are all gunning for automation, we are all gunning for getting things done in a, in a jiffy. We are also seeing a reverse trend where people really want to meet people. Right? We are getting so impersonal that at, at a certain level, you are also seeing that people get uncomfortable not seeing anyone on the other side, especially on the finance. Because you you are trusting your money with someone you don't even see. That's a trend that we will uh, you know want to see how it really unfolds. 
So from, and why I said waves is you'll have your urban areas, your semi-urban and your rural areas. Now the, the adoption of technology across these three is what will be interesting to see. So from an urban area, you, you, you guys will be very, very uh, keen to adopt technology, very keen to see that things are going on very quickly. But you all uh, are extremely financial literate as compared to the other areas in the country. Uh, so how do you, what do you feel is going to happen in the semi-urban and the, and the rural areas is going to be really the question. So the adoption of technology will slowly start percolating into, uh, into the other uh, regions of the country. And unless that happens, really our country is never going to get developed, right? So unless we are able to percolate into those, uh, those regions, that's where we will see that the technology which currently has been adopted by urban will then slowly percolate into semi-urban and rural areas. And then probably we'll see that the urban area is going to get a very different demand. So you'll see different waves really getting created and uh, you'll have different demands coming from various uh, sections of the society. Thanks, Siddharth. So audience, a very fantastic view uh, portrayed by both the panelists here. Uh, both potential in terms of uh, the market as well as potential in terms of the technology. I mean, you guys are standing at uh, the inflection point. Okay, there is the, it's the new era that's going to start off and uh, you need to be equipped with uh, the right kind of, you know, armory to be ready for that kind of era. So I'd like to open the que floor to questions on this particular section about uh, technology and financial services industry. So please feel free to raise your hands. We have people with the mic who will come to you and please ask those questions. Audience. Mike, please, Mike. You're talking about the customers or the customers? Mm. So the, the straight answer to that is if the customers need to understand technology, then it's a useless technology. Right? So technology has to be something that the customers really don't need to understand. Uh, <clears throat> it has to be very, very seamless. Uh, so the entire intent of rolling out technology is that you make it much more convenient to the, to the customers. And it has to be in a way that the learning curve near, really has to be near zero. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, maybe I'd like to um, answer that uh, question. Um, so, see, um, as a part of uh, this mobile banking, okay, there are a lot of new features are getting added, which is making, I'll say, life simpler for even the novice users. Okay, so maybe in that next slide, if you see, there are several things which are there, actually. Um, so, there are biometric kind of uh, uh, mobile banking which are also getting uh, getting enabled, okay. So, you can make a payment or uh, you can uh, no, log into your uh, whatever bank account using just your either retina print or maybe your face print or maybe using a thumb print, okay. So, that is kind of thing are actually already getting uh, enabled in some areas of the world and some of the banks have already started offering. Uh, second is that um, there is already a sort of a social media banks which has come up. I'm not sure how many of you have heard about social media banks. Has anyone heard of it? Okay, so, sorry? 
No, so that is not social media bank. I'll say there is a bank called Fidor Bank, okay, in Germany. Okay, so that is one of the bank which is like now you do banking using your social media accounts. Okay. Oh, Other is that not just lo um, logging in, okay, but you will also sort of a get a interest rate based on the number of likes you get on your social media account. Okay, so they have a Facebook page and they will say that now there's a kind of interest rate we are going to offer. Okay, and uh, depending on the number of likes which will be there on that particular account, uh, that interest rate, they offer that kind of uh, uh, interest rate, okay, so for, the, for the current account. So by every 20th or 25th now, they will say that, okay, what is the kind of a rate which they are about to offer, and then next month they will offer that kind of rate. So people know how to use social media, people know how to do use WhatsApp, okay. So that makes life easier. People know how to, you know, face recognition or you know, uh, biometric uh, recognition, so all this makes Makes, is making life simpler and even, in fact even nowadays even voice payments are also coming into picture so that is also helping actually uh, no voice people so I feel that now there are a lot of innovations which are coming into the uh, into the I'll say market which will be actually you know uh, giving benefits to not just young generation but even the elder generation who don't know how to do the banking okay uh, see at times it is more of a, a giving them comfort that now doing the banking using this kind of new technology is not going to give any issues because of the whatever HTTPS or the kind of security which is there. So since the elder generation doesn't know much about those things, they are a bit worried and they are not, they, are, they feel that technology is complex. But once you make them aware, they will start using it the way they are using WhatsApp or maybe they are using the social media, right? So I feel that there is already tr growing trend towards that which will make life uh, uh, simpler uh, or maybe easier. Yeah, so, uh, I think you said that Facebook was not well understood by people, which I disagree with. Right? Facebook is something which is very well understood uh, by a lot of people. And and that's the reason why the uptake is, is so uh, quick and it's spreading so fast. The same with WhatsApp. Now, the what's going to happen in the future is that it is going to be one interface where you can do anything. So imagine that through your Facebook or through your WhatsApp, if you're able to do transactions with your bank, with a mutual fund, uh, would you want anything else, right? Uh, so you can do anything and everything from a single interface. That's how it's going to uh, happen in the future, especially if the regulator allows it. And I think that our regulator are one of the you know the most prudent and forward looking uh, so that's that's the way it's going to happen also you know when you used to have illiterate people do using their thumbprint on you know on your uh, on the application forms now imagine the same thumbprint is taken on a biometric device right what you needed to put onto a paper now you put onto a biometric device and you are you are really KYC'd immediately, and you can do a transaction immediately. So that's the that's the way things are moving. That's the way things are getting so much more easy. You have this happening with the payment banks, right? That's the intent where the payment banks are going to uh, the local banya shops, and they are the ones initiating transactions for the you know the what we would consider financially illiterate. So if that is happening. I'm sure the more literate people will find it a lot more easier to transact now. Yeah, but Siddharth, I'd like to a little bit disagree over here, okay, that, uh, yeah, I understand that the generation from our age or maybe uh, the, this um, uh, new generation, they are very much aware, but if you see, my, like my father, he's still Ch not uh, using Facebook, not using WhatsApp, and he just needs a mobile phone which plays the songs and which uh, can make the calls. Okay, so there is definitely a sort of a still a section, uh, majority of section, who is still not using, uh, I'll say, um, uh, yeah, yeah. So social I have media or maybe a latest absolutely. technology. But uh, they just know that, okay, using mobile phone, you can just, uh, with um, the touch screen, it works. That is the only thing which they know. It's right? an adoption so, of technology, like ATMs also. So initially, ATMs were not used by people. Now, ATM has yeah, become right. a norm. Yeah. Right. So it's but, more but, of an adoption. But right, correct. But with uh, Paytm, I think uh, it has become more uh, easier ATM, for ATM. people to you know, make a payment uh, to other people. You know? That is a mobile payment, which we know it, I mean. So definitely, that has uh, improved and everybody's using it. Even the vendors, small-time vendors are also using it. They are saying that we are accepting payments, right? Yeah. So, yeah. one more question on this particular, yeah. Yes, my name is Anuj Wadwana. My question to you is, every corner, every corner has two sides. 
ओके नाउ रिसेंटली ऊबर सर्वर गॉट हैक्ड ओके एंड डोंट यू थिंक दैट सच काइंड ऑफ इश्यूज कैन हैपन इन बैंकिंग दिस टेक्नोलॉजिकल सिनेरियो इज आल्सो लाइक देयर आर मेनी हैकर्स हु आर नॉट एथिकल या कैन वी पास दैट क्वेश्चन बिकॉज़ वी हैव अ फुल सेक्शन ऑन दैट राइट ऑन क्लाउड कंप्यूटिंग सो वी विल टेक अप दैट क्वेश्चन ड्यूरिंग दैट टाइम Yeah, no we'll problems. take up the question in the next section. We'll yeah? take it up in the next section. We have an entire section on those aspects. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. So, is it audible? Sir, uh, as you both mentioned that you know uh, this payment banks like it, uh, Airtel Bank, Airtel Payment Bank, and Paytms are increasing their you know uh, customer base uh, every uh, day by day. So I wanted to know how do these companies make money basically? So. Uh, from a payment bank perspective what you're saying is is absolutely right it is in terms of the margins and what they have is is a, it's a extremely difficult business what they are looking at uh, inside this room uh, not to go out say is eventually the money is always made by lending okay so uh, as of now i think uh, rbi has also taken it one step at a time they have not yet allowed uh, payment banks to lend i think bidin uh, will have a much more uh, wider uh, input on this but i think once my my at least outlook is once they start allowing lending they need to get credibility that they'll be able to start lending once the lending starts then you have money coming in also what the payment banks currently are doing is they're doing third party tie ups so they they are not able to do anything those uh, kind of businesses on their own but they are then tying up with uh, others so for example if you if you are having a certain balance then you can get insurance uh, free from a third party you can't give insurance on your own so that's where the innovation really comes in for the payment banks and how they are doing third party tie ups to get uh, the revenues in brain i think yeah um, <clears throat> so i think um, most of the business if you are aware they are making losses only okay so maybe this airtel also one of those uh, business i'll say that and if you are aware like flipkart is also making losses amazon is also making losses okay so how do they make money you must have studied or maybe in your one of your um, um, business classes management classes but um, how they make money is by valuation okay so they just want to capture the customer base okay they want to claim that okay they are they are having maybe 1% 2% 10% market share and that's how they increase their valuation get the investment okay and that's how they grow okay after reaching certain level okay they stop offering this freebies okay and at that point of time with whatever significant uh, market share they start then charging the customer okay so that is how they make money but not initially few years they are able to make money so similarly jio jio is also making losses daily they are picking up maybe i'll say 500 crores from the market okay just to fund this uh, your uh, free um, data or whatever right so all these businesses are like that only okay flipkart if you know i mean they are i mean for every delivery they are making losses of around i think 30 to 40 rupees they are making losses okay but still they are doing it and so that's I, the same model yeah, which i i have a slightly different uh, outlook on that because because in in terms of the e-commerce etc is not a very uh, governed space right it's not regulated whereas on the banking uh, i don't think rbi will allow these banks to go, go into losses uh, they will have to show a very strong uh, book and they are unlike traditional banks per transaction also these banks are allowed to charge uh, so even each deposit and each withdrawal it's a very tiny amount so the only way these banks can really survive is if they have an extremely large base that's why they want to expand as fast as possible because unless they get scale they'll not be able to survive so, so that's my view on it yeah i agree with you siddharth but uh, yeah as, as you had earlier said only that now right now they will capture market share to some extent then they will start offering the cross uh, cross yeah, selling correct. and then they will make money out of that sure. so that is uh, one of the things so yeah. quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of innovative portfolios that are coming in to place because of technology and uh, newer business models uh, good question uh, also in terms of your uh, uh, the usability of technology by different people so i mean a generation of yours no one has taught you how to use uh, linkedin did you attend a training program on how to do linkedin or google or gmail or facebook 
attended attend a three day training program on how to use facebook anyone has done that good business oh, right? model that's a good sign right so a good uh, business model you can start <laughs> so that's how technology is accelerating and uh, becoming simplified also and uh, of course from the future generations once they are used to using it i'm sure most of your parents are also troubling you yes how do i'm not getting to log in to facebook and where do i get this photograph how do i see whatsapp how do i add to contacts so once they're used to it then they are you find them glued to the mobiles right so uh, great so technology increasing becoming simplified uh, simplifying your jobs easy to understand a lot of innovations and business portfolios so we'll talk about the next section we'll talk about the innovations that are there in the financial services space uh, we talked of you said about uh, atm so atm first started we did not have atms uh, before 2002 right and i think a city bank it was city bank which started yeah, city off bank, sir. Barclays. Huh? Barclays, right? barclays 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 and city started. banks yeah. here in uh, india started off with atms that's the first time when we saw actually that you can put a card and get money out so uh, that was an invention and uh, then was plastic money credit cards that came in okay and uh, people started to use that more so now we have you said something on m on ptm and uh, so first from digital payments to now cryptocurrencies and blockchain so i would like to have your views on uh, the new technologies that are coming up uh, what are your views on uh, the most recent launch which uh, government of india has put through npci uh, the upi interface if you have some viewpoints on that we would like to understand what upi is okay so i think uh, upi is uh, i'll say to some extent what i talk about api banking okay whereby that's a unified payment interface which is there visible to the customer and um, by using the common mobile number or whatever mobile number you registered with all the banks you can immediately get a, uh, get a view of your account balances in, from the single mobile app okay so that is uh, one thing uh, which is picked up and uh, slowly is picking up there are i feel that there are some glitches in terms of uh, using this upi uh, mobile app i'm not sure how many have you used it has anyone used it upi how many of you have used okay are you using regularly how how is it do you find any issues okay so uh, basically i have noticed some issues so maybe because of uh, multiple mobile numbers linked to it or whatever Uh, that's where i feel that it is still not picked up the way it should have been uh, but uh, i think slowly it will improve and that is a sort of a, a, a part of a api banking whereby banks are exposing their balance services to a upi common interface and which is uh, showing the balance yeah uh, your views that on um, using of upi or the npci architecture that has been yeah, i think uh, see the overall uh, landscape including upi i think upi is uh, one aspect of it and the uh, the entire pandemonium or aadhar as well i think these these steps by the government by npci are really towards creating a completely integrated uh, uh, payment and financial services across the country maybe at to to with some amount of privacy also being lost but uh, you know i It, these uh, are really looked at by the by the entire globe as as very forward uh, reaching um, initiatives by the government and the regulators uh, by npci uh, so th these are very innovative solutions which have come in uh, it's going to really has the potential of uh, of really you know creating such a seamless and very easy interface for people across the country to start uh, uh, using financial services like brain said there are certain glitches which uh, you guys don't seem to have faced but a lot of people are facing so it's not really picked up but i'm sure as as time you know really goes by it's it's going to pick up uh, uh, very very quickly um uh, so on the payment side it we're seeing a, a very exciting time things are going to keep changing very very quickly npci is getting in so many initiatives one after the other um things are going to get only better from here so uh, we've seen this initiative already in uh, uh, upi from a user perspective and uh, since last uh, one month or last one week i would say 
most of us have gained a lot of uh, large mind share on cryptocurrency so, right so it's a big yes so what was sold for around 11 lakhs last week bitcoin so so bitcoins is kind of a cryptocurrency so definitely being in the financial industry we would like to have your viewpoints on uh, this new cryptocurrency aspect that is coming up so how many of you uh, do you have bitcoins <laughs> none oh instead of uh, i'll say that instead of buying one um, cold drink or uh, maybe some snacks you can still buy some bitcoin are you aware of that yeah so then i think you should start investing it okay anyways yeah so i think uh, cryptocurrency is the new trend which has picked up and um, which is actually um, is going to uh, indirectly disrupt the banking system i'll say to some extent okay so how so um, as a me me as an investor i had a, i purchased a bitcoin maybe a few months back at around uh, 700 okay around 5 uh, 6 months back and um, my intention was that it was not just a uh, investment but instead of putting money into fd my um, approach was that you lend this bitcoin okay to some sites will again give you the interest on that okay so i am i'm not sure you will not be aware of it but there are some sites who are offering sort of a, a fd kind of a interest rate on your bitcoin okay so you purchase it you put it uh, into those uh, um, coin uh, coin bank there is one site coin bank uh, you put it over there and they give you a sort of a 18% interest on your uh, bitcoin okay so which is uh, very significant compared to this so you have double kind of a, i'll say appreciation one is that your bitcoin make appreciate that is one thing and second is that you get a 18% of uh, return on your bitcoin in terms of again bitcoin okay not in the physical currency physical money okay so that is a kind of a double investment which i have done it and that is going to deprive the banks of a funds okay so i'll say that we say oh cryptocurrency is not going to have impact on banks but not like that as and when people will get aware of it will be uh, knowing how to do it they will start doing it okay so that's where maybe uh, less and less fd will anyway interest is going down people are not interested to put money in the fd okay so that's where uh, now it's going to impact the banking industry a lot okay so that is one part and second is that uh, because of the cryptocurrency or because of this uh, uh, bitcoin you can now make payment of for any amount okay so it is like you can even make because bitcoin consists of uh, several millions uh, 1 million bits right so <clears throat> because of that in whatever currency you want to make a payment you can still make a payment to other person okay without uh, without knowing uh, or without uh, have to worry about that so it will be more of a uh, as a cashless payment which is towards digital payments but still you know it, it gives a different aspect to it okay so that is uh, another angle to it and which is uh, definitely impacting uh, uh, banks and the payment system as a whole third thing is that uh, because of cryptocurrency or bitcoin okay i mean you don't know that who who owns the bitcoin okay so because of that actually uh, there is a dark side to it dark side to it is that now now lot of uh, the, kidnappers or uh, uh, hijackers or whatever um, ransomware they are asking the ransom in terms of bitcoins because once you transfer to a particular address you can't trace them okay so that is another thing because of which actually bitcoin prices has started going up in, in last 5 6 months so now there are multiple aspects to it which is actually uh, going to have a different kind of impact on the banking industry or financial industry and uh, now it's going to either benefit or disbenefit the customers as well as the organization yeah so on a lighter note i'm not sure whether you read it in the papers today so bitcoins apparently are a environmental hazard yeah yeah so so the mining of bitcoins is only going to keep getting uh, tougher and tougher and uh, so bitcoins are are going to get really so bitcoin is just one type of cryptocurrency and uh, the industry i think opinion is that just a, uh, over a period of time maybe two or three different currencies are really going to uh, survive the others will probably die out um, but i like biren said it's a completely unregulated space you uh, don't know specifically what is happening over there rbi has already given a lot of uh, warnings 
on that on that front. Uh, but how will cryptocurrencies really gather? Uh, so as of now, I think it's it's a lot of hype which is created in terms of bitcoins and the valuation which is going on. But how will, as a concept, how will bitcoins really start getting more widely accepted? Is if you have actual dealers, like for example Tesla, Tesla allows you to purchase a car using bitcoins. Now if you have vendors and and uh, dealers like that starting to accept bitcoins then you have this really steamrolling it will be a very very different uh, uh, way of accepting payments that is when you know you'll find a lot uh, wider acceptance of bitcoins that is when it will get into mainstream into a daily daily lives of uh, of each individual i'm not sure how that will go whether the uh, whether the governments will, are going to allow it or not, at least RBI has said they will not. But that's something which is which is going to uh, be interesting to follow. Right. So uh, interesting fact that yes, it's going to be having a, a transaction to it, and uh, what we have heard here is uh, yes, uh, from a transaction perspective, uh, there is a technology framework called blockchain, which is going to facilitate this kind of. Uh, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency transactions. So we'd like to understand more about that as to how, what is a blockchain, how does it uh, enable this kind of transactions and what do you see, how does it uh, work, uh, how will it look like uh, in the future in the financial services industry? Yeah, so I think uh, blockchain is a way to go uh, going forward. So I, I'm, I'm hope, I hope everyone knows blockchain, right? Everyone knows it? Okay. Yeah. So um, I think cryptocurrency is also one part of it, but um, I'll say blockchain is a way to go uh, from multiple perspective that uh, it puts everything in the public domain. Okay. And it gives you uh, sort of a control access uh, to view the full ledger history. And uh, third is that it is, I'll say, um, uh, decentralized. So right now, most of the records are centralized and only banks or like whatever is there, registrar, you know, all of them are having the record. So now there are a couple of use cases which are actually coming up and I think will come up also very soon is about uh, uh, land records. Okay. I, uh, is anyone aware of that? Okay. So, so particularly, um, uh, there, are, there are some countries who have actually started making uh, land records uh, public using the blockchain technology. Okay, so whereby you can see the particular uh, property or property uh, uh, or land, their full history of changing hands and how it is moving as a public using the blockchain technology. Okay, so that is one thing which is actually uh, happening in some parts of the world. And second is that... Uh, even in the core banking space, okay, so right now, for particularly if you say TCS or anyone, any any banking system is there, core banking system is there, they are having their, their um, accounts uh, history or whatever ledger records within themselves only, right? So now there are already some, uh, I'll say, prototype is happening whereby this banking software will make the accounts ledger records sort of public in the form of blockchain. Okay, so if you go and visit TCS website, they are already doing the kind of a POC for uh, this kind of thing. So it is like now when I do a withdrawal and uh, he does a uh, deposit, then those kind of will be visible on the blockchain, uh, this one, and it can be accessed using the uh, maybe a proper authority like uh, finance ministry or maybe uh, other banks who wants to do the credit checks or you know, those kind of thing. So it is that way they are going to make this kind of a blockchain uh, you know, usable to a common customer or common public or maybe uh, uh, in the benefit of, I'll say, the society or um, the overall. Right. Okay, so that is that is where there are some uh, developments which are happening and which will definitely, uh, we'll see maybe next one or two years, we'll start hearing more of uh, blockchain records on the um, particular land and uh, on your core banking. Right, so core banking is the again an early adopter of uh, yes. the blockchain that is uh, the blockchain yes. revolution that is going to come about. So does any views on that perspective? Yes, yeah, so if so I was at a Gartner event where uh, we were talking about blockchain. So Gartner perceives that around, uh, I hope everyone's familiar with Gartner. Everyone's, do you all know Gartner? Okay, so Gartner is one of the, from a technology space, The they are kind of evangelists. Uh, Gartner and Forrester, they, uh, they have a lot of experts who, who see or 
predict what are the trends, what are the uh, upcoming technologies that are going to be happening in the near future. Uh, and they are really the leaders in this space. So there we were having a discussion on, on blockchain. So one of the most interesting uh, points which came up was the people who are doing POCs on blockchain are the guys who are actually going to get disrupted by blockchain, and which doesn't really make sense because if blockchain really comes in, all these players are going to vanish. And I have no idea why they themselves are going to do POC on th things that are going to wipe them out. Uh, so when we're, we're talking about banks, etc., doing blockchain, uh, essentially blockchain is is complete disruption of the current way of doing things. Right? And that's essentially where we are seeing that uh, the existence of banks, the existing of exchanges, is really going to come into question. Uh, like Berain said, you know these use cases and uh, POCs are just being done. The potential and the way blockchain can be used is right now just being explored. There is not a single case as of now, uh, except for I think the land records, uh, where really it makes sense to get into, into blockchain. The one question which I keep asking everyone is, uh, there was a POC which was being done by one of our group companies and they were trying to get their supply chain into, into blockchain. So I said, why blockchain? Right? Your existing technologies also can, sub, can support it. How will blockchain really uh, change the way you are doing business? So there was no real answer to it. Everyone is doing it because it's, uh, it's a buzzword. Uh, even, uh, even a land records, you know, why use blockchain? You can use your existing technology and uh, automate and make land records uh, available. So the, the reason, it's a, it's a ledger system, right? It's a ledger system which are going to uh, do away with any kind of uh, regulation. Why are regulators there? To make sure that people are doing the right thing. And blockchain is coming into the picture because you don't need that regulation. It's a self-regulated kind of an environment. So how it is going to really uh, change? If blockchain comes in, it's going to completely transform the uh, the way things happen today. There will be a lot of financial institutions, there will be a lot of regulators, etc., who will no longer be required. So that's the that's the potential of blockchain and how it will really unfold is is anybody's guess right now. But it's it's a potentially uh, complete transformation kind of uh, technology. So great. Uh, so we are at uh, kind of an inflection again where uh, we are seeing uh, technology governing us and introducing self-regulation altogether. Yes. And uh, that's where I would like to bring on the gentleman's question, uh, which he asked in the last session uh, regarding uh, uh, will this kind of technology uh, marginalize uh, the kind of uh, security aspects or uh, uh, the kind of governance aspects surrounding particular transactions. He gave an example of uh, hacking, right? Your question was on hacking, right? So uh, those aspects. So so how blockchain specifically is supposed to be unbreakable because as of now, I don't think there have been... Uh, so that theoretically is supposed to be unbreakable, but I don't think people have really given their mind to breaking blockchain as of now. Uh, it's, I don't think there are enough or enough value as of today to uh, have hackers really put in their effort to hacking uh, blockchain. Uh, blockchain also apparently is getting passe. There's a, a new technology, I, f I forget the name, Green, you know that? Uh, there's a new technology which is supposed to be even uh, better than blockchain, which is now doing the rounds, whether it will really come up or not is, is uh, anyone's guess again. So, you know, we are talking about blockchain, but what is going to come next? We really don't know. Blockchain may also get, uh, you know, completely wiped out by a more emergent technology. Uh, but coming to uh, the the uh, the question on, on the security aspect, yes, it's a very, very real uh, issue. Um, Blockchain is just one part of it, but it's it's a real issue for the existing technologies as well. Uh, and uh, to say today that 
anyone is really completely safe is is a fallacy you just have to do the you know the best that you can in terms of keeping your uh, being very proactive in having uh, the security uh, parameters being put in place the the kind of awareness on security has has really come in in the last couple of years with the adoption of digital uh, you know right from a board down there are questions on how we are ensuring security of our digital uh, information which is there in our uh, in our control so it's more of awareness and what you need to do uh, it's a it's it's an evolution so you have a lot of tools which are coming from artificial intelligence etc which are able to now detect where there are threats which are coming potential uh, hackers who are uh, targeting your sites targeting your uh, your servers so a lot of development happening it's it's a great uh, great space to be in right now in terms of information security a lot of innovations happening over there um, the again uh, i'm since you're not technologists but just for an example you had the uh, mccafes and and semantics coming with traditional antivirus and uh, anti spamming software now you have different kind of technologies coming over there uh, so your mccafes and semantics were were signature based so they used to say that viruses or any kind of patterns which used to have signatures and they would track basis of signatures whether your system is infected or not now that the technology is completely transforming it's completely signature less and they go by a very different technology based on ai to detect whether viruses are there and we have seen that the success rates are much higher so uh, uh, so are you completely 100% safe no you're not 100% safe but the the better financial institutions put in a lot of effort to continually uh, put these uh, firewalls and stuff in place to make sure that uh, to a very very large extent your information is really safe so uh, just out of curiosity has uh, bitcoin been stolen any time any case that you no. Can, no not as no, no, no. Yeah. Bitcoin yes, there, has been, yes, yes, there, there has been a lot of hacking which has been done and uh, in fact uh, some of the exchanges actually overnight closed down Okay, so I think uh, it is uh, nothing is full profile say that. So blockchain has been hacked? No, not blockchain, but cryptocurrency, bitcoins. Yeah, yeah. Bitcoins. So basically, that's part of blockchain only. That is using uh, uh, the zone only. So there are some uh, exchanges where the bitcoin has been stolen overnight, and the exchange has got closed. Okay, so nothing is full proof in this world. Okay, as far as there is a use case of making money or getting some benefits, everything can be hacked. Okay, so even though, as he told, or as we have read in last week, that Uber's data was hacked, actually. Why it was hacked? Because of the money. After Uber gave that uh, money, they had actually released, or rather, they didn't made it public. Okay, so there was, I think, three years back, uh, um, case was there, which actually they have publicized now, saying that, no, it was hacked three years back. So as far as the use case, nothing is uh, foolproof. Okay, so maybe if you want to go to second slide, that's uh, cloud storage, or uh, you want to move Very, back? very ethical thieves. E. We'll keep to ethical thieves. Yeah. So I just want for this section, I just uh, take the audience questions. So if they have any question on that front. Okay, uh, no, so on this cloud thing, maybe I'll just uh, give one example. But, okay, uh, yeah, no anyway, but if you want to move, yeah, move to this one. So I think that was one of your uh, point, right? Uh, cloud storages. Yeah, we'll yeah so whether it is... Uh, I think he's moving to that. It's the next section. Yeah, so basically I think whether cloud storage is... Um, what is a benefit or whether we should use it or not. So as you can read that these are the, some of the benefits which are there. Okay, like um, you can quickly start up whatever application you want, you know, deploy it on the cloud and start using it. But the disadvantage if you see that you should be able to offer all these disadvantages, okay, then only it makes sense for you to go on the cloud storage. Okay, so if you can afford, like if you say you are ready to have a system down for whatever number of hours, then maybe you can afford to go on the cloud. Okay, so I mean, although cloud may not be down, I think all of us knows, right, that cloud is actually more of a server on the public domain, which is not directly within your location, okay, or within your room or within your building. So uh, it will be somewhere away from you, maybe in the different building, different city or different uh, continent, but Ultimately, you have to connect with that cloud using the internet only, right? So, although everything is cloud or server is fine, but if you don't have the internet connectivity, okay, from your place where you are located, then you are handicapped. 
right? So, I mean, if you can afford this kind of thing, then only you should go on the cloud. Second is that uh, security is another thing which uh, we just now discussed, okay? So I'll give you one example. There was one company called uh, Code Space, okay? Which what they used to do is that um, they used to give you uh, to technology company, they used to offer their services to technology company and they used to allow them to store their source code into this particular cloud uh, server. Okay, so they had a lot of customers and at one fine day, what happened, hacker hacked the console, admin console, and they said, you pay the money or I'll, I'll just delete the data. Okay, and this code space company was very, it, it become very popular, you can search on the net also at that point of time, because uh, three, four years back, it was a cloud was a, sort of a new buzzword. And uh, many, many companies were storing their actually source code into a, this company's a cloud space. And someone hacked it and said that, okay, you give me money else I'll close down this thing. And uh, the company actually tried to uh, no, regain the admin console of uh, of their, their whatever uh, cloud um, server. And in that process, uh, hackers realized and they started deleting and they slowly deleted all the right. whatever data was available on cloud and that company had to ultimately close down because they don't have any face to the customer. Okay, so that is a kind of a thing. I mean, although it was very secure, it was there on one of the prominent um, uh, third party vendor, I mean, uh, who was using the, who was offering the cloud services, but uh, can't do anything. When there was a sort of a internal, I'll say a person who had given the sort of a password, admin console password to a hacker, you can't do anything, right? I mean, you, there is no no point. I mean, struggling or fighting with those kind of hackers because they have admin password, and then then we try to uh, restore from daughter uh, DR server over DR also the same admin console password was there, and hacker then started deleting the code. They wiped out everything on the cloud, and then they that company had to close down. Okay, so there are different kind of use cases which are there because of which i mean we keep regularly keep hearing that and um, you don't have any control on that recently this ransomware which was there right, right? so they started asking uh, your um, whatever you give us a bitcoin in terms of bitcoin else we'll uh, delete your hard disk and i think many of us have faced that and many of us have paid also okay so as far as there is a use case okay and then hackers will go into it and will hack it so in this particular ransomware, I'll say that now what they were targeting is kind of a user who can at least pay 300, 400 kind of dollars kind of a worth of Bitcoin. Okay, they were not targeting a small user like me and you who might not be having any significant data except for maybe just a, a bank account statement or a returns which were filed, I mean. Right. So, so, so I think security yeah. security is as good as it gets. Yeah. Okay, and I think there is one thing about uh, security that... Uh, the stronger it is, the more uh, hacking ha does happen. It kinds of a mentality, I think. So I'll just give an analogy. So today, uh, all of you, what do you think would be, who would be having the best security in the world? In the best security, which person enjoys the best security in the world today? Who doesn't have anything <laughs> on the online? So I would put it as, yes, the President of United States of America. Right? So he has everything right from bullet cars, etc, etc, etc. But uh, the President of United States as a position has had the most number of assassination attempts, has had the most number of assassinations. Right? So uh, I see there's some link between, yes, if the security goes higher and higher, there is that mentality to keep on hacking. And I think they find it as a challenge. And that's where as, uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as humanity, we evolve, you know, the better it gets. So we try and get more from Novtal to digital locks to your, uh, uh, from your apps, you can control your locks, etc., etc. right? So, right. so from security, definitely, yes, uh, we get into it. Any questions from the audience? Sir, just one, you have the mic? Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. Sir, as we, uh, you mentioned about the cryptocurrency and bitcoins. So it is growing and emerging currency day by day. So after a few years, when the bitcoins get really, uh, you know, uh, in the market, get into the market, and uh, all of a sudden, they, you know, uh, stop the thing, you know, because that is not authoritative, uh, nobody's taking the responsibility of bitcoin, because that is still unknown. And the, one of the associates from the Bank of America, they mentioned this is a fake currency. So what is the backup plan, you know, what you will you think, as a companies like Tesla also, you know, Transacting on that oh, purpose. That's the point. There's no backup. 
right? You're you're on your own. That's what RBI has also said that it's see it's a like I said, you have to understand it's a paradigm shift. You your your rupee, your dollar, everything is controlled by the government, right? You have someone responsible for those currencies. So tomorrow, if uh, Bitcoin just keeps crashing, if your rupee crashes, RBI comes in to say that you know you have to control it. Bitcoin crashes, it crashes. There's, it's absolutely self-regulated. Tomorrow, uh, so someone saying it's fake currency, you have to also understand uh, Bitcoins and uh, these kind of technologies are challenging the status quo of the regulator. So if Bitcoin comes in, where does the regulator, or where does RBI go? <laughs> so if that becomes very prevalent, you're, you're undermining the authority of, of all the uh, bodies which are currently there. So it's, it's a very different way of thinking. It's like it's a new world order, right? It's a new world order, and uh, if Bitcoin goes down, it goes down. You have to take that risk. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, I like to add to that um, is that um, yes, bankers will say that because now their weightage will come down or go down with the cryptocurrencies. So that is um, definitely they will say that it's a fake currency. But considering that uh, U.S., Canada, Japan, and I think now Australia is also thinking. All these three major economies have already approved it and they are officially allowing to trade into Bitcoin. There are ATMs also whereby you can withdraw the actual physical keys, cash if you have the Bitcoins. Okay, and there is a futures uh, trading also which has started last week in the US uh, stock market or the exchange. So considering all this, I don't think that it is going to go die down very soon. Yes, the price will be volatile definitely. And... Um, Again, as he had said that uh, since the regulator does not have a control on it, they are a bit scared, okay? Because nowadays the, the trend of whatever world or I'll say the financial industry is changing in such a way, okay, that everyone is scared that if this will result into bubble or not. So obviously there are both pros and cons that everyone thinks that it can go down also and someone says that no, it will appreciate also, right? And recently if you've read um, one of the... Uh, strategist or one of the um, one of the I, I forgot the name uh, that gentleman had predicted that uh, the Bitcoin price will go up to hundred thousand dollars okay so which people are uh, feeling that he is exaggerating but I think in past he has done some of the very good predictions and which has actually uh, turned out to be true okay so when it was maybe a five thousand or six thousand ten thousand people were thinking oh it's going crazy but now with uh, futures trading happening it is at now twenty thousand which is the fact and which is a reality so i, I think it's nobody's gaze actually that now what will happen it is more of a open uh, thing i mean depending on how market turns or how the world adopts to it the things will change i mean right so uh, i think excellent view on uh, what would uh, the dark side as well as uh, the good side about the technologies that are coming in. Uh, we all now are living in a world where uh, uh, how many of you have downloaded an app on your mobile phones? Most. Any Most. app? Please raise your hand. Okay. How many, have, how many of you have uh, pressed accept without reading what is there in that? Everyone. Okay. Now, who is responsible for the security that we have, yeah. right? So definitely, on, if I look at it from a positive perspective, yes, we are living in a world where we are uh, collaborating, okay? And uh, that's where I would like to hear from uh, the speakers here as to what are the kind of regulations or regulatory frameworks in place in India from a security perspective where we can reach out to. So as uh, management students, we would like to hear from you that yes, what are the kind of frameworks that we need to take care of when we are in the corporate world and what would be these kind of frameworks or how they will develop in the next one or two years? Yeah, so uh, there's a clear focus from the regulators in terms of the, uh, in terms of cyber security. So each regulator with, who is there controlling different uh, sections of the financial industry uh, they have a cyber security framework. So for banks, RBI has uh, given a cyber security framework for uh, uh, for the exchanges, for mutual funds, SEBI has uh, has given. And it is mandated that uh, uh, these frameworks are, are really adopted to. And uh, uh, see, one of the main things which has come is that you have a, everyone has to have a CISO. 
and that's your uh, chief information security officer so who is whose job is to just focus only on on uh, the information security and cyber security uh, so it's a very exhaustive list of uh, uh, guidelines which and framework which the regulator gives you have to abide by those as a minimum and over and above that you you choose you can choose what you want to do basis the level of uh, uh, technology advancement that you have in your own uh, organization uh, and there is also rbi does it annually they they come and uh, uh, do an audit uh, sebi comes uh, once in two years so there is a strict uh, uh, audit process also uh, rbi is very strict in terms of uh, the regulations and how you are adopting if you found wanting in any of these aspects uh, you know the banks are really done for um, therefore the regulator uh, you know it's very well respected rbi and uh, you know across the globe rbi is very well uh, recognized and respected because they are pretty forward looking they keep uh, revising uh, at times the banks will say they are even unreasonably demanding that uh, things get put in place at an extremely short notice so if there is a uh, something like a wanna cry or something comes in uh, you know they really make sure that things have to be done very very quickly and you have to report back to the regulator with the controls and measures which are uh, which are put in place to ensure such uh, uh, things don't happen in the future right so uh, do you, uh, from a from an india perspective do you think that initiatives uh, such as uh, the gst or uh, digitization or the aadhar card number are all the these initiatives linked to a greater vision of uh, making the financial services industry as well as the consumer and businesses more adaptable to the changes that are happening in the financial services due to technology yeah so <clears throat> okay so first of all I'll go back at uh, sorry rahul i come back to your answer but i'll first like to go back to kind of fraud which are there can you just go to next slide please okay so these are the sort of uh, frauds which are happening as of now i'll say that um, that these are some, you might be knowing some of these uh, frauds like phishing identity theft card skimming okay phishing all these things okay so basically these are the some of the things which are happening and uh, knowingly or unknowingly i think uh, some of us are actually accepting the uh, the risk also by maybe as rahul said using the mobile app or maybe accepting the some terms and conditions without actually reading it okay so uh, there are several kinds of frauds which are happening now uh, the main thing is that yes there are cyber crimes cyber uh, cell which is active or rather there is a sort of a um, banking uh, arm which is actually ensuring that any kind of cyber crime which is happening regarding financial irregularities are being addressed but still people are not aware that you now whom to reach how to reach and what to do so many a times we realize that now people are losing money we keep reading actually every day we are reading that now in today also i think there was a uh, one article saying that some executive lost maybe a few lakhs uh, because of this kind of cyber crimes so i mean my point is that yes cyber crimes keeps happening but at the same time there has to be control to be in place by we as a consumer also and if it happens then we have to report to cyber crime and uh, they in fact helps nowadays to uh, to actually track back your actual money or whatever loss is there to certain extent okay so there are regulations which are in place but uh, i'll say that still that awareness is not there which gets you back the money or we, people are at times bit shy okay of uh, reporting this kind of uh, uh, crime to someone saying that people will think that he is a stupid or he is a fool but that is not the case actually everyone gets you know, uh, uh, duped because of the similar kind of websites or uh, things like that so one should not be feel like that and we should report uh, good thing is that in uh, india particularly um, the kind of controls which are in place that really stops from uh, now you getting duped okay maybe for one or other reason i'll give you one particular example of myself okay that um, one side gone to a restaurant and i paid by credit card that was i think around 3 4 years back uh five years back and uh, i forgot to uh, take back my credit card okay so i left it and i didn't realize because we had gone with friends and we were chit chatting and uh, we came back 
and uh, that was i think over the weekend i didn't realize on uh, till monday or tuesday when suddenly i got a message saying that na uh, your credit card has been swiped for what or 5000 or 6000 rupees and then i suddenly realized oh boss uh, i mean who has swiped it I, I, because i know that my wife doesn't uh, <laughs> swipe that she is uh, kind to me i mean <laughs> so um, so i uh, immediately tried to tr uh, check my wallet and figure out where is the card and, I, and then i realized oh I, the card is not there with me and then i tried to recall back okay where i had used my card last time and then i realized that in i had uh, used it in one of the restaurants and then i realized i didn't um, uh, took back the card i mean so that's where immediately i called up the um, uh, credit card uh, bank and uh, immediately told them that uh, my card has been used by someone and before actually i i was i was trying to search other uh, transaction happen okay so around 6 7000 so i i was unable to figure out and i told bank that please block my card immediately and tell me from where it has been used okay so the bank executives were very helpful immediately told me that this card is being used at this particular uh, uh, station or this particular store and immediately I rushed back to that store and i tried to figure out that which store was it i immediately called them up saying that boss uh, this card is being used by someone who is not authorized is my card he has stolen it and uh, you just make this guy sit over there okay and they in fact uh, made that uh, person sit there and immediately I went there i told him and i told him and he said okay this is a guy and i told him that oh, boss you how are you using my card and i told him and um, that's how uh, no, i was able to court uh, that person and the uh, no, bank helped actually to you know, immediately block the card okay so that is a very large example which i faced and because of the kind of regulation is there like you, know, the, you have to immediately send a sms to a consumer that is where it helps and nowadays with even further uh, the one level of protection which has been added is whereby uh, you have to enter the pin for doing any credit card transaction and that pin, pin comes on your mobile so again that is another level of regulation which is there okay so i i feel that the kind of regulation which is there in the india is one of the strongest uh, regulation which is there i'll i'll give you another example also uh, uh, that the same way my card had actually expired credit card and didn't realize i used it into a amazon us okay because i had an account in amazon us also and i i i entered the card number and whatever expiry date and the code which is there cvv code behind that and it took it and it uh, transaction passed through on the us website okay whereas actually card expired Okay, so just imagine the kind of regulation which is there in US and the kind of regulation which is present over here. That now over here, if it is expired, uh, then it will not allow you to pass through it. Okay, and it will uh, always ask for uh, OTP if it is a valid card, which does not happen into Amazon US. And my transaction passed through, even my uh, shipment also come. I mean, and I, I didn't realize. I was thinking that now vendor will call back and ask me that, okay, yeah, you need to make payment. But it has not happened. And on some of the website, you can't uh, even speak to customer services also. So no, you you see the difference I mean right so I'll, let me tell you that the kind of regulation which you have is very strong in India and uh, RBI is always I'll say one step ahead in terms of now ensuring that now customer is protected okay so whenever anything happens you ensure that now you immediately contact the right authority report the um, uh, crime or whatever the issue and I think it gets resolved so that is. So fantastic view here on terms of how secured we are in the uh, today's world, even for conducting the financial transactions. Uh, any questions from the audience? Audience questions, please take the mic. Yeah, please uh, take the mic. Okay, good question. So um, I'll say that um, it is uh, it is the companies or the corporates who are using this technology. Okay, not the individuals. Uh, and obviously, the companies or corporate have a pressure in terms of showing the profitability. Okay, so with using this AI or the robots or the kind of automation, they can bring down the cost by I'll say maybe one third or two third or whatever number of you can put it down for the kind of industry which is there, and that is where they are trying to adopt this technology and trying to maybe uh, cut down on the cost. So that is one view. Second view is that um, at times you don't get the people to do the kind of job. Okay, so if you are aware, like if you if you if you have been to Japan. 
many of the things are automated things okay you will not re require any kind of human intervention okay why because they don't have people to handle that kind of human intervention okay so that is a shortage of people that is one in some cases it might be unskilled people also okay but in some cases also skilled people because nowadays there are a lot of people available in the i mean i'll say that um, um, graduates are available in the market but they are not having the right skill to do the job okay so that's where i mean having don't having right skill uh, hampers your delivery right so that's where people are trying to find the alternatives and try to see that whether it can be automated or not and that is another reason which they are doing it and obviously then with the, having a human there is a definitely a kind of um, a human angle to it obviously that now people will not be well or will be going on leave or rather having right so those things are not there in the automation and that is where people are trying to do that way okay so in fact i'll say that uh, in uh, my particular company also um, we used to, we, we are doing the kind of a automation automation to some extent so in terms of the build also in terms of a deployment of a source code okay we try to do the automation because getting the person at the odd hours or maybe having a uh, maybe multiple person making doing this thing becomes difficult and as person leaves again uh, you have to ensure that now other person also uh, does the same thing so some of these petty jobs or i'll say the, the i'll say trivial jobs are being automated to a extent so that you now the people are more productive for uh, i'll say more skilled uh, requirements okay so that is so, another uh, thing it should be see technology can always be used for good or bad right uh, it's you could say that about nuclear technology as well so you have nuclear technology which can be used for immense benefit or it can be used for immense destruction now ai is uh, so AI, when we we are talking about AI, true true AI actually is very very limited as of as of now. Uh, the more prevalent ones which we are, which we are talking about in terms of uh, artificial intelligence is not so advanced, right? What could really pose pose threat to us as as humanity? It's it's not really gotten there. I think the the most uh, uh, advanced use case of artificial intelligence is the driverless cars, where they're they're really using uh, artificial intelligence over there. But what you're seeing in most of the organizations, I think 99.5 percent of the organizations which you're seeing, AI is is more in terms of the is more in terms of the machine learning, where like Biren was saying, it's more getting things automated. It's more of automation which is which is being done. Uh, the what we were talking about earlier, frauds. Right. So, if frauds frauds have always been happening, either it's been without digital or uh, even when there was paper, there was always fraud happening. It's nothing uh, new. But how do you catch fraud? If you are able to use machine intelligence to crunch a lot of information to catch frauds, wouldn't you want to do it? So, it's more on it's more a philosophical discussion. You know, it's uh, whether you want to use it for the for good or for bad. Uh, all technology right now, the same technology is being used to build good uh, uh, experience for the customers. The same technology is being used for hacking. It's not a very different technology. So it's how you're using technology which makes all the difference. So in terms of that debate, I think it will always be an ongoing debate whether you want to use AI or not. In most cases, AI as of now is not really uh, artificial intelligence. It's more of learning which happens, basis the data which is there. And how do you solve a problem? That's that's to a large extent what it is right now. Right. So from a, uh, we have one more question. So from uh, sir here. Ah, uh, hold on, sir, sir. So if you use the mic, it gets uh, the question gets recorded properly in the. Hello. Yeah. Uh, sir, earlier visualizing company like of uh, say five thousand crore, ten thousand crore, and we're visualizing that in those type of. 5,000 crore companies, at least 5,000 people were working. And these days of AI and all that, uh, maybe a 5,000 company uh, may be run by five people only. So the job opportunities are uh, getting lesser and lesser. And all the presentations which we had today uh, were focusing or were uh, reflecting more job opportunities towards the, towards the technical sides or engineering side of the things. So under this scenario, especially in financial services domain, so what kind of job opportunities will be available for management graduates in times to come? And what kind of skill sets will be, will be required for them to nurture? 
so that uh, their employability could be enhanced. If you can throw some light on this, so probably it will be much uh, useful. Yeah, very good question. I think uh, I'll say that uh, haven't thought much about that, but uh, let me just um, speak out of my um, what instinct is that. Um, See, till the time there is a, a certain angle, a human angle is there, there is definitely a human is required to do, uh, handle what that kind of job. So even though there is automation to a large extent, there, there is a need for a person who handles that automation, right? I mean, because there will be always exception which will be there, or there is always a need to do that automation or to, to put a thinking not to do that automation, that's why it is required. So I'll say that from management perspective, definitely that kind of opportunities will be there, that you know, if you start thinking a little bit out of box, or you start demonstrating your, uh, I'll say, creative or innovative side, there will be definitely opportunities for you in uh, in the banking or any any segment you say. But um, I, particularly if you ask me that uh, whether it's uh, there is a job in the analyst uh, perspective or maybe from a project management perspective, I think that that is anywhere there. See, uh, as a, from the organization perspective, what as of now uh, the problems we face is that we don't find the person having the right skill. So if you see in my organization, at least intellect, we are having around 300 to 400 open positions are there. Okay, we continuously keep recruiting people and then we find that they are not up to the, our requirements. Okay, and then they have to either retrench or maybe they have to, uh, you know, we have to find a more suitable positions. So, uh, it is more about, you know, aligning yourself that, okay, you want to build career in this particular angle and then I think you can drive towards that. Um, other thing is that whatever new technology is there, on that there is a lot of opportunities there. So, particularly if you say AI or robotics or mobility or cloud, or NLP. So there are a lot of opportunities in the, I'll say, in these areas, even from the banking perspective. Okay, so all these areas, maybe uh, Siddharth, you want to add something? Yeah, so my views are, uh, like I said at the onset, the paradigms are shifting, right? The, the demands of the jobs in, your, uh, in the organizations are changing. What was there traditionally is definitely going to change. And you have to keep up with uh, the latest trends in the market. So whatever was happening from a finance and accounting perspective will be very, very different by the time you guys, uh, you know, pass out. So how uh, you're going to be keeping up with uh, getting in new innovation into the organizations is, is going to be the critical factor for you. Uh, uh, so for example, people who are able to get their skills up on and how to use data analytics, how are you going to use information which is already there. Uh, you, If you all are able to get ideas through um, and when you're able to present these to the organization, that will add much more value to your profile than you know just being uh, management graduates who are, who are going to come out. You also see that uh, the trends is that there are so many people who are not technologists who are getting into technology and uh, as technology entrepreneurs. Uh, the reason is that it's not just technology which uh, which are driving uh, uh, new innovation. Uh, like he said, there are uh, companies which are maybe 5,000 crores, 10,000 crores, 50,000 crores, which are run by 10 or 50 uh, manned people. Why is, why is it that way? It's because the idea is now what drives valuation. So it's the idea that you get and the value that you get to your jobs, which will be the most important than, you know, what uh, what has been traditionally being done. Um, you know, even if you, if what we are talking about, the frauds, you have uh, right now calls coming immediately. Many of you all would have got calls if you, if you have traveled internationally and then suddenly uh, you've done a transaction, you immediately get a call or an SMS if uh, you know if a transaction like that happens now this is a this is a new thought process so if you are able to get these kind of thought processes in then it adds value all the processes are definitely going to get automated that's a given right all anything which can be done very quickly or it's repeated will will is going to get automated very very quickly so your thought process is always to be on what is the value add you know, it's for the students as well as for the uh, professors over here. How do you give real industry experience to the uh, the students on what will, uh, and it's an ever-evolving field. So you have to keep yourself 
very uh, you know up to speed with what are the new innovations with data analytics you should get into data analytics because that's uh, a huge space and it's very relevant across all verticals all different uh, uh, fields which are there uh, that's going to be very very critical so uh, it is a real uh, thread that anything which is repeatable is going to get automated so you have to think out of the box on how you're going to be relevant thanks for that one more question please Can data mining or data warehousing be a possible breach to a person's security? So it's a very subjective question. Uh, it's it depends on the kind of uh, organization that you're dealing with, right? Uh, most reputable uh, organizations, financial institutions, will not allow the information to get, go out. Uh, so when you are when you're dealing with a bank or a mutual fund or any regulated uh, entity whatever information you're giving is kept extremely private there are very strict uh, guidelines around it you're not allowed to share that information with anyone so there you don't uh, i don't think there'll be too much of a case of uh, breach of privacy but it's a different story when you're when you're interacting with uh, uh, different apps which can be gaming apps which can be e-commerce sites which can be you know all which are not within a regulatory framework there it is up to the discretion what you have accepted right so whether you're reading what you're accepting or not in most cases if when you're uh, when you are installing a game or you're installing any other app if you read through what you are accepting you'll probably not want to accept Right, uh, because you are basically saying that you're giving permission for any information that you are collecting to be be shared with anyone, and it's not only it's it's pretty scary actually. Uh, your your entire uh, habit of using the phone, of your uh, everyday habits can be recorded, and it is being used very very effectively. So again, there's a positive and uh, and a negative side to it how it's being used. So it can be converted into very very uh, uh, easy features for you to use so you won't even realize how come these guys know what i'm going to do next you'll probably see some things which are popping up on your phone where you're trying you're planning a meet with your friends or you're planning on traveling someone will know before you know that you're going to be doing it so that's basis the uh, the usability factor what you're doing on a day to day basis uh, which which gets recorded and at artificial intelligence can then be used to predict what you're doing. Uh, so depending on where you're transacting, uh, on the finance side, I think we are very safe, especially if you're doing it with the responsible financial institutions, your your data is pretty safe. Any, any further questions from the audience? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one is, so will Paytm and similar kind of uh, organizations become a competition to traditional banking? Yes, very much. In fact, uh, they started with just um, uh, mobile uh, app only or mobile uh, payment company only. And now they are already into, I'll say, uh, banking, right? They've got a banking license. So they are actually threat to whatever current banks which are there. And uh, if you see not only banks, but they are also uh, any any new technology or new company, they are obviously start, uh, they are very good to grab the market share. And that's where they, they will start doing anything. They will be agile, they will be responsive, and they will be giving good benefits to our customers. So I feel that, yes, it is uh, definitely a threat to uh, banks, I mean. And uh, they've already taken up a quite uh, handsome market share compared to number of years they've spent into the industry. And uh, they also get into this uh, now uh, e-commerce also, which you must be aware, Paytm mall. So they are getting into all these uh, things. And not only this one Paytm e-wallet, but there are also other uh, wallet companies who are also actually um, uh, looking to get market share. And that's what's happening. Yeah. So there are some questions over here. Yeah. I had a question. Uh, How omni-channel uh, experiences uh, can help the customer 
uh, with respect to uh, uh, as everyone is plan going to the augmented reality and virtual reality. So how banks are segmenting the market and how they are capturing uh, it uh, with respect to underserved uh, customer and unserved customer in the rural areas. So I'll say that, um, see, traditionally banks were trying to be omni-channel, but if you see the new generation banks, they're trying to be only mobile-only banks. Okay, so like uh, recently DBS, someone said, right, DG Bank or DBS. Yep. So yeah, so that is only mobile-only bank, okay? They started like that in India. And in Europe also, if you see, there are some banks, Starlink Bank, okay, Atom Bank, okay? All of these are just mobile-only banks. They don't have literally any branches. They are just maybe head office or maybe a central office. So I feel that uh, omni-channel is only to cater to the maybe uh, one segment of a uh, uh, generation, okay, or other uh, maybe a uh, one, who are, who are not that uh, technology literate, I'll say that. Uh, but uh, the trend is more towards mobility only, and that is how uh, it's going to grow. And even for the rural areas also, I think uh, setting up infrastructure may be difficult, but setting up a mobile tower is much easier, and uh, maybe that will be the way forward. And um, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think several banks are offering uh, a mobile banking app or a facility to uh, do transaction in the regional languages, okay? So which, which is one of the constraints within our um, country because of the whatever, uh, but uh, with that kind of thing will slowly change. And also using the biometric uh, kind of a facility integrated with mobility apps, I think uh, that will be more of a, um, beneficial to rural areas, I mean. So I, I don't, uh, uh, answering your question on virtual reality and augmented reality, uh, I have not seen too many real uh, worthy use cases on the financial side. Uh, if it's being done, it's being done more from attracting customers. It's more of a gimmick, uh, you know, to facilitate better uh, interaction with the customer than a real need uh, for having real value added to the uh, to the services which have been given. And I think omni-channel, when you're saying, uh, what we mean by omni-channel is you come uh, through any channel, right? The customer needs to have the same kind of experience across uh, multiple channels. So there are certain use cases, at least for uh, for us, where when you are a new customer to a mutual fund, you know, you would, uh, we have seen use cases where customers wanting to uh, uh, explore different products which are there. It's not very friendly on uh, on a mobile because you will want to see a lot more data, right? Uh, you know, the, the performance, you'll want to read what the, what the fund is doing, how it's been performing, what are the comparative funds, Etc., which becomes a little more cumbersome on the on the mobile. So that's where omni-channel really comes in, where you're saying that if someone flips from a mobile to your desktop, how do you make sure that the experience remains the same? So you continue on the desktop where you left on the mobile. That's the use cases which are coming. Uh, also, for example, that when you have, uh, you're doing a transaction, I think Policy Bazaar, etc., do that, you, you go to a place and then you drop off over there and then you immediately get a call from someone and then you click on the link it's not that you're starting from the uh, from ground zero you continue from where you had left off so those are the kind of experiences that you want to give from an omni-channel perspective so that you don't get lost even today if you go to any bank's mobile versus a desktop the experience is very very different Whereas you wouldn't want that as a customer, you will want a very same look and feel, the same way of navigating. And mobile, uh, if you look at it, it has lesser uh, uh, real estate to cater to uh, to the customer's demands. So you have a very diff you have slightly different use cases than on the on the desktop. Now also there is a case. I don't know how many of you guys you guys should validate it. There is a there is something called an app fatigue. So I'm, so how many of you guys are tired of using apps, of downloading apps? And so quite a bit. So good, I should get my digital marketing guys over here. Uh, they're refusing to look at it. Uh, but that's the other thing, right? Uh, everyone's getting tired of, of downloading apps. That's the new way of going. Uh, newer technologies from Google is now coming in terms of uh, PWA instant apps, which actually don't need you to download apps. So what you get on the desktop is what you get onto the mobile. Uh, it'll feel like an app, but it's not really an app. Uh, so those are coming, which will aid omni-channel uh, to a very large extent. 
because you don't need to do two developments from a technology standpoint. You have an app being developed, a desktop being developed. In most cases, there are different teams developing them. So you have a disconnect of what is being developed where. So that's the way it is progressing. Yeah, app of apps, basically. That's what you are saying. No, I don't think so. No, no, no. So it's not app of apps. It's uh, what I was talking about is actually a website. Uh, but when you ha are on the mobile, it'll feel like an app. So if you, that's why the look and feel will remain the same. So if you're on the mobile, it'll feel like an app. When you go onto the desktop, it'll be, it'll behave like a normal desktop website. Uh, that's the technology which is coming in. Just to extend to what uh, Siddharth was saying is that, see, um, they're, they're not exactly AR or VR kind of uh, experience in the banking segment, but if you see in this slide, I mean, there are some robots which have been placed in some of the banks, okay, who are actually helping uh, no, customer to get engaged or rather not to solve them when uh, when the people, are, human people are not, uh, human persons are not there or maybe when uh, um, to handle some of the things like no, multilingual uh, robots are there will answer it or maybe there will be a robot who will recognize your face and then accordingly greet you or maybe no, try to answer you your query. So those kind of things are coming up but not exactly I'll say that AR or uh, VR uh, is that much there. Someone yeah. yeah, hello sir, I have a question for uh, sir. So uh, I just wanted to know like uh, in mobile marketing when we compare it uh, with uh, in fact mobile banking when we compare it with the uh, traditional banking so in that, uh, what, as a consumer, what is the benefit for me from a mobile banking? Because uh, what I have learned is like mobile banking, uh, they don't give you loan and also they don't give you interest on what you invest and all those things. So it, no, how no, far no. it is true and I just want to know about it. No, no, so that's absolutely not uh, true. Uh, if someone is doing that, please report it. They are not, <laughs> they're not allowed to do that. So mobile banking is nothing but giving a mobile interface to your traditional banking. There's nothing different. So uh, if you are depositing money in from a mobile bank, the banks are mandated and regulated to give you the same level of interest as you're doing when you are uh, going to a branch and depositing money. There's absolutely nothing different. Mobile banking is only so that you get the convenience of never ever wanting, needing to visit a, a branch. So you can do anything sitting at home or traveling or any time you can, you can do it. If you want to uh, deposit funds, transfer funds, uh, even loans, the own, it could be different because when you're giving loans in banks, there is a different process to, uh, to uh, assess your credibility in terms of whether you're going to pay it back or not. Uh, so that is the only reason. So you have a lot of uh, banks now giving you instant loans, right? Basis the uh, history that you have with the with the banks, they will give you instant loans, which you will get as an SMS or a notification in your app that you can just go click and uh, get the money. So there's nothing that you can't. Uh, there's nothing like that. Thank you, sir. Okay, so uh, maybe from that uh, lending perspective, there's a couple of uh, use cases which I just want to highlight is uh, regarding this peer-to-peer -peer lending. How many of you have used the peer-to-peer -peer lending? Uh, when I say peer to peer means not just friends lending money to you <laughs> or um, but uh, there are some websites which actually gives you money uh, not peer to peer lending is there. So there is a f website called Faircent uh, whereby uh, no, you can place either your requirements or you can even lend your money to someone okay in very controlled manner and the kind of uh, returns which is there on these websites or I'll say that uh, is definitely phenomenal and maybe you want to try even with 1000 rupees or maybe 5000 rupees just to get a hang of the technology and how it works but uh, that is again a new trend which is there which is a sort of a I'll say a fallout of crowdsourcing or crowdfunding uh, kind of a thing so here you can place your requirement that you need 20,000 or 30,000 or 50,000 whatever amount of money you want it and uh, based on your credit record uh, will be available or displayed to uh, lenders and lenders can make a decision how much uh, they want to lend to you. Okay, so it will be very uh, sort of an open uh, platform kind of a thing whereby how your uh, uh, lending is taking place or how, how much people have lended till now, all those things are visible over there. So just go and try it out, that is uh, one of the very good concept and whatever small savings you can have, uh, you have, you can uh, earn uh, 
maybe good interest or good return uh, over here compared to the FD. But yeah, you have to take a little bit of risk, I mean. So that is one thing uh, which is there. And second is that I just want to highlight some of the new things is IoT-based insurance pricing, which is again, um, uh, I'll say, impacting the banks or maybe a financial industry, is that um, uh, you can have, um, I mean, US it has started, uh, not in U uh, India yet, but um, basically uh, based on your driving patterns, okay, you can get either insurance up or down, insurance premium up or down. So I think most of you might be having uh, some other vehicles and we are paying the regular insurance premium, right? And as we know that even though if you don't do any, uh, don't claim anything, accident claims are done, still the maybe a next year's insurance premium will be just little less, maybe 5% less, or if the insurance uh, overall price has increased, then it might be the same or it might be more. But uh, there is a new concept whereby uh, um, company, insurance company will install some sensors on your car, okay, so based on your driving pattern, okay, they will decide that how much rash driver you are or how much uh, no, good driver you are. Okay, so like the way if you suddenly accelerate, then based on the sensors which which will track your geolocation, they know that okay, you suddenly cross this 100 uh, kilometers within whatever one hour, or you cross 100 kilometers in maybe five hours. So all those kind of things now will decide that uh, how good, or how bad your driver is. And based on that, they will offer you a discount in terms of your next insurance. Okay, pre premium. So or that, increase it. yeah. Or increase it. Yeah, or increase it, correct, obviously, I mean, so obviously the rash drivers will not prefer to um, uh, get it installed, but uh, good drivers, uh, like many, many of us, or most of us will be, um, will prefer to say that, okay, fine, you install that uh, sensor over here, and we'll get a benefit. So that is um, another new thing which is coming up, and which is actually um, slowly going to change the face of maybe Indian insurance industry, but uh, already started in US. Okay, then there is a sort of a micro insurance, so, uh, that, that, was, that was not a concept maybe a few years back, but nowadays you can take insurance for whatever small things. Like if you're going to take a flight, okay, and then there, you can take an insurance that no, you will not miss the flight. Or you can even uh, for mobile phone also, you know, I mean, you can take a um, insurance, right? So whatever small, small things are there or incidents are there for that also you can take an insurance and um, that helps you to uh, cover the risk, uh, which is obviously one part of our life and uh, that, that helps actually. So these are the, some of the new things which are uh, there in the industry and um, that's coming up very well. Yeah. Is yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Uh, RBI Act, uh, Money Lending Act, so which uh, requires you to have license no, from so, the government. So yeah, is it a reality peer-to-peer -peer lending? No, or? no, it is there. It is in India only. I have, I have lended the money. You can go and check it out, fairsend.com. You have to create but the... Is there any legal yeah, support is, to... No, no, so there is a framework support which is there. Okay, so RBI is only permitted and it is uh, very much uh, within the framework of, uh, um, I'll say, RBI. Okay, so you can go and check it out. You can lend the money. So they also give assurance that how will how, how they will try to do the recovery in case if it they face. And now with the civil score being available public, and now all the banks or all the all the financial companies are trying to are having access to civil score. I think everyone is scared and no one wants to default actually with uh, uh, with um, lending or borrowing kind of a thing. Okay, so that is very much there. And uh, see, on this uh, website portal, you can also see that what is a credit score of the borrower. Okay, what is the kind of history he has. Okay, everything you can see over there. That how many times he has borrowed the payment, how many times he has returned the payment, uh, is he having any other loans outstanding, what is the kind of business he is doing, what is the kind of monthly re uh, return he is having right now, whether he stays on a rented house or not. So all those details are there. So it is very much in the within the boundary and the framework of uh, RBI, and it is um, it is very valid. How much uh, rate of interest did you get got from? Later? Yeah, so see, uh, they give the different kind of profiles depending on the risk appetite. So they they have eighteen percent interest, twenty four percent rate interest, thirty six percent return uh, interest. So different kind of uh, returns can be assured based on uh, the kind of uh, risk you are risk appetite you have. Did so 18%, 18%, 18%. 18%.
kind of so thing. so you can see that the person has a requirement of 1 lakh or 5 lakh and uh, they will say that okay how much you want to fund you want to fund maybe 5000 rupees you can fund 5000 rupees so and that will also show that how many people have already lended what is the percentage which has gone into it okay and once everyone full funding happens then the your tenure starts and uh, you start earning the interest so it is very much there i mean I haven't checked much, but um, I mean, from that perspective, ceiling perspective, I have not checked. I have just landed a small amount, so just to test the waters, because I keep doing that uh, now for my different experiences. So, but yeah. you can check it out. So, new technologies here are, uh, and new business models are meant to be explored. And uh, I think uh, uh, risk, all of us are um, uh, management students, risk is directly proportional to the profitability. So, how much risk you take, that much profit you'll get. Definitely. So, any any further questions? Oh, so many, yeah. One more. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so my doubt is talking about financial services sector. I cannot help but mention Bajaj Finance. So, be. Yeah. In uh, March 2017, the stock uh, share, the share price of Bajaj Finance was approximately to, uh, 2,500. It rose uh, to a double, approximately 5,500 in September 17. So what are the factors that had uh, attributed to the growth of uh, this share prices, basically? We're, we're technology guys. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, so it's uh, actually... No, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer to some extent because I'm investor also and uh, yes. I'm technologist also. Okay, so I think uh, share prices just reflects the kind of... Um, profit co company is expected to uh, make, okay, or the kind of market share is going to capture. So particularly in case of Bajaj Finso, uh, what I have noticed is that they have started tying up with a lot of uh, um, small time vendors, okay, uh, white goods uh, customers, okay, white goods uh, stores also, and uh, they have started offering uh, loans for lot more, uh, I'll say, uh, market share, okay, and so, and that is how their business model seems to be growing. And that is why the share prices are actually growing. Sir, uh, as we are talking about technological disruption, so that's the reason I asked, because providing many online services which uh, other private lenders are not providing, like credit, home loans. So, so the MBFC market itself uh, has grown significantly. So if you see all the players, so of course Bajaj Finserv has done phenomenally well. But if you look at any of the other NBFCs also, they have done pretty well in that, in the same time frame. So. I don't, I have not seen, I'm not an expert on, on this, so I wouldn't want to comment, but most of these are doing pretty well. No, but I think you are right. I mean, Bajaj Pin Service uh, come up very significant, I mean, significantly well in last uh, two to three years because I had bought it at 750 and now it is actually 5,000 plus. So, yeah. Current. Yeah, so, uh, and what I've noticed is that if you go to any Vijay sales store or anywhere you will go, you will see the Bajaj Pin Serve um, now pamphlet which will be there, say that now they are ready to loan. And I think uh, all the financial company will grow because now with uh, growing regulation, okay, with a uh, lot of interconnection, or I'll say um, uh, Aadhaar card, bank account, everything getting linked and the regulation becoming more stringent, people are not allowed to default, okay, and if they default, then they have to pay out of their nose, okay, so that is kind of a thing which is happening and which is benefiting our full banking industry, okay. Thank you, sir. So we have uh, time for one more question. Uh, so, yeah, one of you. Make the choice, please. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, sir, my question was, uh, like, as we were talking about Bitcoins, if we keep the securities part aside, like whether it is safe or not. Uh, yesterday, there was a survey in Economic Times which showed that all the developing countries are more influenced towards Bitcoins and are, are, are trying to do the best out of it from the Bitcoins. And as you mentioned that the developed nations like USA, Japan, they are legalizing, they are accepting these currencies as their normal routine. Correct. So does these countries see any potential which the developing countries have seen already? And that is that the reason that they are uh, making it their normal source of, uh, what you can say, exchange? Because in the developing countries like China, uh, yesterday it was shown that the maximum of Bitcoins which are used all over the world, the 48% is from China. And all these developing countries are slowly in encouraging Bitcoins as they are not uh, legally encouraging, but people are still influencing towards the Bitcoins. So is there certain potential which these developing countries had seen earlier and the developed countries has recognized it and hence they have allowed it? Or it's just because it's trendy? 
Okay, um, so I'll uh, I'll have a two views on this. One view is that um, see with digital with Bitcoin. Okay, when you make a payment, there's a digital payment. Okay, so even to buy a pay, uh, Bitcoin, you have to pay it either from your credit card or you have to pay from your bank account, right? So basically, uh, the legal transaction takes place. And that shows that some amount or money is there in the bank, okay? And banks wants that only that now everything should get legalized. Legalized in the sense that uh, transaction should happen in a white, okay? So that is one view of it that because of that, uh, all the countries are uh, promoting uh, digital payments or digital transactions, okay? But other view is that yes, once the money goes into Bitcoin, okay, unless and until it comes back to a banking system again, okay, it remains a notional or virtual. Okay, so once it is notional or virtual, if you keep changing hands, then government will not know that uh, how money is being spent. So in that case, there will be definitely loss to the government or the country or the institution. But uh, unless and until it doesn't come back, it, it doesn't uh, uh, give benefit to the banking industry. And that is where like uh, as of now also IT department, if you heard that they are saying that now whoever is trading into Bitcoin, so trading is buying and selling on that they are trying to levy the income tax. But if you don't do that, then they will not come to know. It's only they will only come to know that I have invested, but I have not transacted back. So, in fact, the dark side of Bitcoin is that now it is also being used on the for whatever hawala thing or for uh, uh, yeah for for whatever underworld kind of activities. Okay, so which is not good actually. But yes, uh, we don't know exactly what goes into the developed countries' mind as of now. Uh, yeah, but I need to definitely research on this. That's a very good question. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Right. So we'll give him one chance. So he has this one question left. So we'll give him one chance. Yes. No, I'm sorry, I'm not aware of it. Good that you told me. Definitely, maybe next time when we meet, I'll try to give you that answer. But that's very so good. So I'll just like to say that, see, in, in terms of what we had said earlier, whatever he says in terms of what he knows is what is the possible way of hacking uh, the blockchain, it may not be the only thing. And what he has talked about would, would require phenomenal amount of computing power. Right? So you need, you will probably need someone with a really bad intent to put in such kind of infrastructure which will cost millions to try and hack uh, you know the blockchain so theoretically yes whether someone really has the intent of putting in so much of infrastructure to uh, to hack the blockchain is and put in millions of dollars to do it is a secondary question so it's more of a theoretical possibility so you you put in so much of horsepower behind it, then you'll probably be able to crack it. Yeah, last 30 seconds, one question. Last one question. Right. So, uh, regulation can be no, no, no. Okay, what is the regulation I think you, for. Uh, you have been sabotaged by the rest of them. So, what is the regulation on MDR? MDR, right? What's the no, I'm not aware. Can you can you elaborate on MDR? What is that? The government or they're allowing banks to to charge. Yeah. Banks, yeah, right. Yeah, so I don't think that there will be any impact uh, because anyway, technology has to cater to that, right? Uh, so how do you think that it will have impact? Do you have any views on this? No, it's more of a matter of it's opened up to the discretion of the banks to allow for a debit. Now it's whether big is the competition, whether banks will really do it or not is the question. It may happen that where there is not enough of deposit. So why will a bank charge if you're not earning enough from a customer? And so I think that is where the industry will move. So if you have very low deposits, then they'll say we're not earning enough from you as a customer. So we will probably uh, look at charging you for your transactions 
if you have if you are a pretty high net worth and you're giving enough money then uh, you know competition will make sure that they will not charge for those transactions so uh, i think uh, good q and a session i i'm sure you all have a lot of been, lot many questions yes. uh, we'll definitely uh, ask them offline uh, we have limited time so we need to go further with the proceedings so a uh, fantastic uh, session on this panel side and uh, so all of us are actually today convinced that we are at this uh, inflection point where we would be using these advances in technologies maybe big data ai robotics chatbots in the financial industry and it's there for disrupting the existing models traditional banking will no longer be same how you invest or transact is completely going to change with bitcoin cryptocurrency blockchains uh, all that is going to change it all depends on us how creative we become or how destructive we become so uh, and uh, that that's how I'd, i would like to summarize and once again uh, i would like to uh, thank our panelists here i would uh, request i just like to say one last thing is i was I think as a panel, we are really happy that from an audience with finance as a major that so many questions on technology have, has come up. And uh, just to say that you, don't, you guys don't need to know the, the actual technology, but what is going to be more important is how are you going to use the technology. So that's, I think, uh, where you guys need to focus and that should be probably the takeout of the entire session, from at least from my perspective. Thanks, Siddharth. Thank you, Birin. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Suchi Gautam to please uh, uh, present a memento to the panelists here. And uh, Dr. O. Mashtankar, sir, please. From a panel discussion perspective and uh, from Thakur Institute of Management Studies and Research, I really thank the panelists on uh, being part of our journey to align our management education, our management training towards what the industry requires. So this is one of the initiatives that we have taken to align what you know about and what the industry is asking for. Okay. So this is a kind of uh, a program in which we are trying to ensure that you are in line with the emergent trends of the industry. And when you graduate through this course, you are ready for the future. You are ready or equipped with the knowledge that you require. right? And I really thank uh, both these gentlemen here uh, to help us. Uh, and we look forward to their support to nurturing our uh, industry and institute relationship further. So thanks a lot, the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rahul. And uh, thank you, faculty and students, for being a wonderful audience. And uh, we really enjoyed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, for the students, please uh, remain in class. Uh, please, now you can switch on your mobiles. We have circulated a uh, feedback form. We want it digitally. Get your responses digitally on that, OK? Yeah, so I, thank I you. think we'll really appreciate uh, with uh, feedback so that, uh, yeah. Guys, one small announcement. Finance students have to come to SSE only at 2 o'clock for their simulation process, and the MHO students have to go on the fifth floor for the simulation process at 2 o'clock, so you can go have your lunch and then come back. Thank you. Check. Check. Guys, before leaving, please make sure that you are submitting your orders to your respective CRs, and the people who went